please don't refer to it like in the beginning. <laughs> Try to work the exercise out. But if you're really stuck, here are the solutions. And then I also just have the presentation uh, notes up here just for um, everyone to have. So just wanted to do some housekeeping before um, starting the presentation. So let me just share this. So um, this was a um, workshop that was actually done at USAR 2020 with um, Sebastian and then Jacob. Um, we did it at the end of July and it was three hours, but for the sake of time, um, we're just gonna do two hours and we're gonna focus on using dplyr and tmap when it comes to spatial data handling and visualization. And um, there's a link to the original material of the course. And then um, the materials for the workshop um, is um, like if you just click on the here. So does everyone actually have the link to the present station slides? Because if not, if someone could put that link in the chat box, um, that would be great. Because that's pretty much your to go to place for um, everything. But uh, we have a lot to cover, so I'm just going to get started. Um, so I just want to give an overview of what this workshop is going to cover. Um, we're going to talk about just the basics of cartography and mapping. Um, I feel like it's extremely, extremely, extremely important that if you're going to be, like, if you want to do this as something long term, you really do need to understand some of these cartographic and um, G GIS concepts. And then after that, we're going to just play around with vector data. And I'll explain what vector data is if you don't know. And we're just going to um, read the data in and then change it to a particular projection. And then after that, once we get that piece in, because reading in data, well, it's very important um, and making sure it's properly formatted. Drawing maps of R, which is what everyone really likes, you know, the fun part. Um, we're going to play with that. And then um, the nice thing about drawing maps of R is that if you know dplyr, well, you know how to do some um, operations with spatial data. So we're going to play with that. And then finally, I'm going to just um, give you a preview of like, if you want to learn more, this is what you should learn. Um, again, we actually did cover this in the USAR um, workshop, but due to time, um, I'm not covering it. But uh, like I said, the materials are on um, Sebastian's um, GitHub. So um, there will be three exercises to complete. And so to make this a more collaborative activity, we're gonna have people um, assigned to breakout rooms. And um, three of us, all three of us, like Inger, Vibosh, and I, we're gonna go from one breakout room to another to help people with you know, anything. And I'm gonna give 15 minutes to complete the exercises, but like if say people completed it in like 10 minutes, we can just go on. So I'll check every five minutes to see how everyone's doing. And if enough people are like, oh, we're done within 10 minutes, we'll just unbreak. We'll just bring everybody back to the main room and then um, we'll just go on. So let's talk about the basis of cartography, which is the art of drawing a map. So, you know, when we think about maps, you know, we just see it for face value and maybe not investigate like what it really is, but it is more or less a two-dimensional representation of all or part of our planet. Um, you know, the, you know, you're pretty much putting a 3D surface on a 2D surface and there's various things that happen in between that. Um, it's just not a magical process. Um, there is a particular way in which you do that yourself and it depends on what region you're creating a map of like if it's just you know of south africa you're going to use one way of doing it if it's of the whole world you're going to use another way so the process in doing this is not um the the steps are standardized but the little parts are not and are based on your area of interest so what is a projection um it is a method that is the method in which you 
put this 3D surface into a um, 2D format. And I'm not gonna go like all into this, but there's various projections that preserve certain things and that like does not preserve other things. I think the most infamous projection is the Mercator projection because it really distorts size so much. And so it creates this representation of the world that's not true. However, it is good for navigation because it preserves um, distance. So when you think of a projection, just think of like there's a piece of paper and then the ball is your earth and you're just wrapping that piece of paper in different ways. And those different ways reflect the way that when you, when it's transferred to a 2D surface, it's going um, to look. And like I said, I have more information about the different types of projections um, in my slide notes. Um, but just know that like when the paper's wrapped around, it either touches at one point, which is a standard parallel, or it touches at two points, um, which is a secant. But like I said, I will just move on from that. <laughs> And if you have any questions, just let me know. Ooh, oh my goodness. Okay. So, um, in, in the R context, um, you refer to these projections as CRS, Coordinate Reference System. And it is utmost important that you need to know your projection of your data sets. When I'm like teaching people GIS and people are complaining about my data is not working. The first thing I ask is, did you project your data? Um, no, should I? Yes, <laughs> you should. So chances are, if there's something, there's like a, a, I have a top five list, but that's definitely on the top five, five is that your data is not projected. Um, and if you have data projected in different projections and you try to put them in R, they're not gonna show up in the same location. So, um, just make sure that you find a name of your coordinate reference system of your spatial object. I personally just search on Google. Like if there's an area that I don't usually use, I'm just like, okay, what's the coordinates reference system for, you know, this place? And it pops up quite easily. Um, another acronym you might want to know is EPSG. That's another um, way you can find this uh, CRS information because the numbers are the same. So um, yeah, these are various um, CRSs that, well, they're probably variables that refer to CRSs. So let me go to the next one. So um, the way that it's referred to in R um, is also starting to change. Um, so, um, like for example, any um, version of the SX package before 0 0.9, the CRS is represented by a list with two components, the EPSG, which I mentioned, and then this project for string. So it's like project from this projection to that projection. But now um, the CRS is represented by two components, which is the WKT and the input. And I put a link in the notes if you wanted to find out more about this because I'm more of a, okay, it changed, I'm just gonna do it. <laughs> and if I wanna understand it more, I'll read about it. So, but it is important to know that if you have an old version of SF, um, it's gonna be a little bit different in how you project things. So there are two major types of geographic data. And um, I like this because it's kind of like a, a cookie co cutter. Um, there was some, I think there was some architect that kind of came up with this, uh, Ian McCarg, he came up with this idea of layers in which spatial data represents various real world objects. So as you can see, um, what you see on this uh, picture, you see a vector in which dots represent customers, lines represent streets, and, um, polygons can represent parcels or it can represent like school districts or anything. And then raster data, it can represent something like elevation and land usage. And all of this is a representation of 
the real world. Um, but just know, you know, like just realize that even data has its limits and representation. So, um, yeah. Okay. So vector objects, like I said before, they're points, lines, and polygons. And the storage, um, it really depends. The standard that's being used today by a lot of people in GIS or people who work in spatial, in the spatial realm, is called a shape file, which has actually several files. But um, there's something new called a geo package, um, which is just one file. And that saves a lot of hassle when it comes to chain, like transferring files. And then another um, type of um, spatial data is called raster objects, in which you have a grid of values, and um, each grid has a number assigned to it, which means that there's a particular classification. So let's just, like a, one big thing in GIS that's done is land use classification. So like in this case that you see, maybe zero means no data, and one might mean like bodies of water, and two might mean forested land. So each number has a representation. And so um, in R, there's several packages, such as SF, STARS, and uh, Terra. Um, but we're going to use um, SF um, for today's um, uh, class, I mean, for today's workshop. Um, but um, if you're like, what, you know, what else should I know? I mean, you should know all of them, but for me, SF and Argoodle, I don't ever know how to pronounce that. My coworker always calls it Argoodle. Those are two that I use um, regularly, and I use SP too. So here's a quiz, and you can um, answer it, like you can unmute yourself, or you can just put it in the chat. So what is the first question to ask yourself when you have a problem with your spatial data manipulations? Um, did I reboot my computer? What is your projection? What is the format of my spatial data? Is it Doris's fault? Because she doesn't know how to teach this stuff. <laughs> so any answers? Yes, it is B. It is B. Um, C2, like, like for me is B, but C is also valid about what is the format of my spatial data. I can tell you from a GIS context that I've seen students, like, they're trying to put in raster data. And this isn't really as big as a problem with R, but they'll work with raster data. And they're like, I can't get it to work. And I'm like, show me your process. And they show me your process. And I said, you're using a process to um, put vector data in and not raster data in. So use the proper function. And they're like, oh, okay, my bad. So yeah, C is also a very, that would be my number two <laughs> for me, you know, for that. Because yeah, it, it's so easy to get it confused. But in our context, you know, it's a little bit simpler. <laughs> So let's just have a summary. Um, you know, projections are just extremely important. So um, please look them up before you do anything and assign your data a projection. Because if you want to run spatial analysis, um, the program needs to know what reference it's working with. And in the past, in the real, like for real world applications, there have been issues in which people use the wrong project projection um, or datum, and it has caused havoc, you know. So, you know, if you don't look them up and you're doing some kind of spatial analysis um, and you're like, it can cause trouble um, if you're trying to give this output to policymakers or people who are actually doing something with it. Um, so, uh, and then just, you know, we're going to be working with vector data for this workshop, which are points, lines, and polygons. And then, then um, yeah, raster data is just a grid of data which can represent elevation or um, temperature. It can represent a lot of stuff. Um, 
So moving forward, we are now going to, oh, well first, does anyone have any questions before I move on? Okay, seems like I will just move on. Um, so now we're gonna learn how to do um, some reading and projecting of data with SF, which um, I really do like this package because I just find it so simple for me. Um, and you use the read SF function in order to read in data. Um, and I kind of touched on this um, before about the types of data. Um, you can do shape files, um, CSV data. Um, I work a lot with CSV data. Um, I've also worked a lot with GeoJSON during a summer. So it handles all these types of formats. Um, just a little quick thing about the shapefile, which is the standard. Um, the problem with the shapefile is that like it's made up of many files. So if you're trying to like do a quick transfer, you can sometimes accidentally forget some of these files. And then when you try to like import your data, it's gonna have an error because it has to have all those files to read. So that's why the geo package is nice because it's just literally one file, dot G, gpkg. The dot shp is like, okay, it's gonna refer to that, but it needs like four other files to do its thing. So um, if you wanna, um, if for future, like if you're like trying to do this work in like now and you see yourself doing it in the future, um, I would recommend using more geo packages. I mean, this is something I just, I'm like also telling myself that too, because like I work a lot in shape files. Um, so um, it really depends on where you get your data. Um, it either is going to have a coordinate reference system or it's not. And you can check that with um, st underscore crs. Um, you know, like, I notice, like if I get data from say like a city organization, they're pretty decent about, you know, giving me that, but some places they just don't um, have it. But when you do um, ST underscore CRS, um, this is kind of the information that you uh, get. Yeah, geo packages are quicker than shape files too. Um, and then there's also a storage issue that geo packages don't have that shape files do have, I believe. So there's actually a lot of advantages to using geo packages. So um, that's gonna be my New Year's, res well, it's too late to really do a New Year's resolution, but half year slash New Year's resolution is to use more geo packages in my workflow. So um, let's just say you get um, data from um, somewhere and it doesn't have a projection at all. Um, this is usually the case for me with um, when I have like a like a like an Excel file or something like that um, or a CSV file I was blinking out for a second and there's just nothing in there. Um, I'm gonna have to transform it to some system and I'm just gonna give you kind of just like some pointers based on my workflow with dealing with uh, CSV data. Um, the first thing you need to do is transform it into this one that's not really, it's not really projection um, at all. It's just a reference system. It's just latitude and longitude. And that's called WGS84, um, World Geodetic Survey 84. Um, and that will put latitude and longitude points onto your um, points. Um, that's the first step. So if you're dealing with um, that kind of CSV data, please put your data in this first, um, because I've just noticed, and even like with working C with GIS software, that you have to do this step first, and then you can project it to the proper projection. Um, and yeah, you just use the read um, underscore CSV for, um, function to just read in your data, so it's pretty quick. Um, and as you can see, this has the longitude and latitudes attached to it, but you still need to turn it into some kind of spatial object. And how do you do that? Use st underscore s underscore sf. And 
the big point that you should remember is that you put the longitude first and then the latitude first. I mean, second, that was a lot of trial and error for me to figure out what was going on. So um, just rem um, that was one big point to remember. And then after that, you just set your um, CRS. So when you're done, like projecting your data and all of that, um, you can actually write that out to whatever spatial format of your choice with the right underscore SF, which is what's going on um, here. Um, after this person, after the CSV file was put in and the points are turned into a spatial object, then I just put it into a geo package. And just a good data management practice is to just to keep yourself like kind of like knowledge of like so you know what you did put like whatever variable name underscore in your projection so you can kind of know i'm like okay that's wgs84 or oh that's you know this projection Let me just go on all right we have another quiz and actually uh yeah there was a problem with this quiz at the user 2020 but I fixed it. <laughs> so um, what's the correct way to deal with the following text file with coordinates to be used as a spatial points data set? So it's just a few sample, three sample points with lags and longs. So if we could have people write that in the chat, that would be great. Can we get a little bit some more and I'll wait for some more answers here. Okay, we're getting a lot of A's and we're getting a lot of C's. Well, it's time to break the answer, uh, you know, break the silence about the answer. It is A um, because um, as I mentioned before, um, you want to make sure you put your longitudes first and then your latitudes first. Um, so um, I, I wasted several hours not realizing this when, because I did see. It was just driving me up the wall. So um, I learned the hard way that you have to do it via A. So that's another thing you might want to check like if you're having problems. Um, oh, did I, when I did ST underscore S, underscore SF, you know, did I put my longitude first or did I put my longitude second? So I would say that's a number three on the list of things you should check if something's wrong. So in summary, um, we just talked about a couple of these packages and SF, and we're going to really expand upon um, some of these in the next section. But the first thing we're going to do before that um, is that we're going to, um, and you, I hope you, everyone had the chance to copy the project um, from my RStudio cloud to your RStudio cloud. And um, sorry about that. Oh no, it's going. Um, we're going to do the exercises, spatial vectors, data, read and project. Um, and there'll be 15 minutes for this exercise. And then when you get to ex exercise this drawing maps of R, um, you can just stop. Um, how many people do we have in the, um, okay, we have 23 people. So should we do like, like four, four, like there's three of us. So um, maybe, I don't know what would be the best thing to do, like three groups or four groups. I was, my mind's saying four. four. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll just uh, break up in four groups and um, I'm going to find a timer. <laughs> I'll just do, I'll just use my phone actually, apps.
So um, everyone likes to draw maps because it's fun, but you have to sometimes ask yourself, do you really need it? So here are just some questions that you can kind of think about when it comes to whether you need a map or not. Um, if there is something, you're, if there's some kind of spatial relationship that you're looking for, then by, you know, by all means, use a map. Um, and then just think about the three other questions about like, what's your question? How you want to communicate it? Can people get this message quickly? Um, for example, you can see this bar chart and it shows you like the name of the um, cafes, um, the, the cafe bars per department, which is like the French administrative unit. Um, but really, are you interested in knowing where they're at? So that's what the map does. It can tell you like where are the most the you know cafes. So there's also some basic visualization rules, and this is just the tip of the iceberg, by the way. There are so many rules. I mean, like, it's the more rules you know, the better visualizations you can make. But um, for qualitative data. So like data that doesn't have like, um, like types of animals, dog, you know, dog, cat, whatever. Um, you're gonna, shapes or colors will be good for that. Um, for me, a rule of thumb is anything over five is, is too much. So also make sure you're not like plotting every single thing that you can. Um, so then for um, quantitative data, um, you have absolute and relative quantitative data. And I always feel like this is the most violated rule. Let's just say you have a bunch of um, like regions and let's just go back to the dogs and cats. And you wanna see the amount of pet ownership, the number of people who have pets per region. Um, you do not wanna represent that by um, number because having like a household that like, like 10 households to have cats in a community of 100 people is very different than a household, 10 households who have cats in a region that has like 10,000 people. So um, you just have to really consider these type of rules in terms of displaying your data because you might be misleading people. Um, there's this book called How to Lie with Maps. I highly recommend people to read it if you're interested in like the implications of bad visualization. Um, so yeah, that's just my main takeaway. Um, make sure you use the proper visualization rule for the type of data you're using. Okay, so let's just say you already read, you know, you did all the stuff and you wrote your, um, What's the name of the book? Um, how to lie? How to lie with maps? How to lie with maps? By Mark. I'm just gonna um, put it in here. It's like a. There we go. How to lie with maps by Mark Mominer. So um. To go back um, to what I was saying about reading in files. Oh, no problem. Yeah, you can just read in your file from whatever data source you um, got your data from with read underscore sf. And this is what this code is doing here. Um, it's just reading in the geo package for Europe and then the French department and then there's the cafes and bars in France. And then you can use get working directory. Just make sure you put everything in, you know, like you're reading it from the right location. Or you could just use the here package, to be honest, too. Okay, so now we're talking about um, making the map. So um, if you are dealing with polygons, you want to use T. M. Well, first you have to do the T M shape to like create your environment. And then, based on whether it's points, lines, or polygons, you're going to use the appropriate functions. Um, 
So for example, for this map, which um, I'm just gonna say, this does not follow sound visualization rules because this legend has way too much going on. And also the text is, it's not clean. But just to give you just an example, this, you know, a working example. Um, this is a map of all the departments in France. And as you can see, you first have your Europe shape because R does have some packages in which you can um, get the countries. Add your polygons. Um, and then you add your department. And then um, you fill it by the name of the department. And then you just give it a set. And let's just say you want to make the borders pop out more, you can do just plus TM borders. So it's kind of like TM shape, TM polygon, TM shape, TM whatever. So now we're going to talk about T map more. Um, let's just say you're finished with your map. Now you need to add elements. Um, the most important, the most like the required elements of a map is the title a north bar, a north arrow, which some people might seem be like redundant because they're like, oh, well, north is just up. Well, you know, it all depends on how you're mapping things. So it's just always proper map making etiquette to put the north arrow so people have a reference. A scale. Um, and then one thing that's not in this on this um, map, but I always put it on it, and it's mentioned, I think, in your exercise, is put in your name, your date, and the data source so people can look up the data if um, they are interested. So as you can see, to add those elements, the scale bar, um, I guess there's a default location to be bottom right, because usually that's where people put it. The compass location in the right top, and you can set that by position, and then the layout, which has the title. So we have another quiz, yay. Okay, so how would you draw like the French department on a map? A, B, C, or D? Okay, we're getting a D here, getting a C, getting a couple of C's and D's, sorry C. Okay, we gotta, well, I'm gonna break the answer and say that um, the answer is indeed C. You know, think of it as a sandwich structure. You got to do your shape, then your polygon, and then you add on to whatever you want to that. And then if you want to add something else, you do shape, whatever, whatever. So, you know, in short, just make sure that um, if you need a map, draw a map. And just make sure to follow the sound rules of drawing a map, which is why I really recommend that you read books on data visualization and mapping because that'll make you a better map maker. Um, and then we also went over to functions to draw, to read in the shape file and to do just various simple elements with drawing your map. Um, and you can always export that as a PDF or JPEG or GIF, may I add. So we have another activity. Um, so um, 15 minutes will be allotted for that. So, um, so, so it's 21, two, three, four, five, six. So like, it's like what, 726? Yeah, it, if we could just come back a little bit before half the hour, that would be good. Like 726. If, um, so if we could just break out and break using dplyr to play with your spatial data, which you can do.
Um, we talked about read SF and read um, CSV. So it's very important to know that data is in rectangular form. And you can use those good old dplyr verbs for these SF objects, which is great in my opinion. So in this example, um, the various departments were um, consolidated into the Breton um, region. Um, you can see the mutating function was used to just kind of like change the, I guess, the titling. And then certain things were selected. And then it was just filtered to show the Breton region. Oh, sorry, it's not consolidated yet. It's just selection. So it's very similar. Like the nice thing about GIS is like if you learn that you can filter data, it's all about move, when you move forward, it's like, how do you do it in this and that? So that's, that was the nice thing about dplyr. It's like, oh, I already know how to filter data. I just need to know how to do it specifically for in our environment. And you can also, I really like this one. Now this is when you're consolidating things and you're aggregating to bigger levels. So you can change the department to regions and all you do is a group by and summarize function, which is great. Like if you're starting from like, you don't know anything about spatial functions, but you know how to do dplyr. Once you get to the second and third steps of actually learning spatial functions, you can say, oh yeah, this spatial function in R works just like a group by and summarize in dplyr. And one of the most important things in spatial data work, especially like if you're working with, I don't know, like, like for example, having schools match up to the districts and you get something from the Department of Education and you have like your governmental data, um, they might have a common field, which is called a key. Um, and you can do a join function in which you can join one data set to another based on that common column, which is like called a key. So let's just look at this example. So we're working with the department and you also have information about the number of inhabitants by age by department. So you wanna join the second one, like the inhabitants to the first one. Um, the department. So the CSV file to the shape file. And um, you just want to do an inner join. So I think you only want to um, show what is actually um, available in both of the um, data sets. So um, Something like, yeah. Um, so yeah, as you can see, you do the inner join in which it returns all the rows in X where there's matching values in Y and all the values, columns from X and Y. And then if there's multiple matches, all of them are returned. Um, it can be a little confusing, but the more and more you work with these joins, um, you'll know like what to use. Um, but yeah. So you can just do the inner join, and now all of that data is joined to the shape file from the CSV. Um, personally, I like the left join the best. That's the one I use the most. Okay, so this might be a tricky question just because we didn't have time to go into it, but I'll just kind of help people out. So, what code do you use to join an external classical data set restaurants with the spatial data set France underscore 193? If you want to keep some um, entities where there's only a match, I'm going to put a link in the chat in which there's a dplyr vignette because it does a far better job at explaining it than I do. And um, based on that, um, you can determine um, the answer. So let's see what we got here. Let's 
gonna wait for a few more answers. Getting a lot of D's and you are correct. It is D because um, you're joining the restaurants to France underscore one to 93 and you only want where there's a match. So, oh no, no, nah, sorry. Okay, so we, we learned a little bit about how you can apply dplyr um, and then just something about the joins. And um, just note that there's compatibility with tidier functions. So um, why don't I first, like, we'll do this part um, in a second. I just want to finish off and then you can have time for the exercises. So there are some second steps. Like I said, we didn't have time to go over them today. Um, because originally this workshop was three hours. So you can use so many spatial functions to manipulate your data. Um, I going to like all of these are really good. Like ST distance, you want to know the distance between two points. That one is one that I would use a lot. A centroid. Um, so the centroid is considered the center of a particular polygon um, data set. Um, and there's certain, um, there's certain incidents in which you might uh, need to use that. Um, I also find that, I find that to be a useful function for me. And then like a buffer, like for example, you can see like, like if you wanna see like the number of bus stops in an area within a five kilometer area, you can run a buffer around each point with a five kilometer radius. So there's just so much that you can do. Um, and I highly recommend that you try, you take a look at the geocomputation with our book um, that by Robin Lovelace and Jacob to um, learn more about that. And yeah, you can just also refer to the workshop um, section that we talked about that. So to go back, um, because now we're gonna have, um, we're gonna break out again to do the manipulating vector data with dplyr. And then we'll come back um, five before eight. Um, so we could just break out into the rooms and then um, we can use the five, last five minutes of today's workshop to wrap up. So this actually worked out perfectly. I'm just gonna stop sharing. And yeah, you know, just feel free to like, if you're a little behind, feel free to use this time in any way that you want.